Hi, I'm John Burlingame, and we're here in the studio today with Nicholas Brutel, who is Oscar-nominated for his score for If Beale Street Could Talk. Nick, thanks for being with us. Thank you so much for having me here. So you had done Moonlight for director Barry Jenkins. Yes. So was it sort of automatic that he called you for the Beale Street project? I was hoping to get the chance to keep working with Barry. Um, you know, it really was a continuation of our process together. Um, when he talked to me about uh, doing Beale Street, um, I read the script, had read the book, and uh, the thing I love about Barry is he always has these incredible early instincts about what the music might feel like. Um, and this is before he shot the film, you know, so uh, same thing with Moonlight, actually. You know, we had met before he shot Moonlight and we started a conversation. Um, and I think one of the things I'm always most fascinated about is the ideas that you generate from that early place when you haven't seen anything and how do they, you know, how do they translate, how do they work once the film is shot? Like, what is, what is that alchemy between the music and the film, you know? But it's interesting that the director is already thinking about music even before shooting. Barry thinks about everything. He uh, loves music. And actually, um, I think in, in a very uh, sort of, a, not just in an artistic way, but in almost like an unconscious way, I think mu there is a feeling of music just latent within what he's imagining for the film. Um, he also spends a lot of time thinking about the types of music that will be placed inside the film, like as source. So, uh, for example, in Moonlight, um, the Hello Stranger piece that you hear in the diner, the Barbara Lewis, um, he wrote that into the script in Moonlight. And so, you know, very consciously was like, we are going to have this in that scene. So similarly on Beale Street, did he write some of those songs into the script? Interesting. He didn't write them in, but he told me there were a few pieces he would love to have in them. So, for example, the uh, Miles Davis Blue and Green, um, I Wish I Knew John Coltrane. Those were two pieces I think that, you know, he wanted in specific places in the film, if possible. So what kind of discussions did you guys have in those early days? His first uh, thoughts to me were that he said he was imagining the sound of brass and horns. That was the, that was the first thing he said, you know, and... Did he say why? Um, not really, actually. That was, you know, and that's what I love about Barry. It, you know, it, it is, these are these big picture kinds of ideas um, where it gives me a lot of leeway to explore things. We had a couple conversations where, you know, we talked about the world of the film. We talked about uh, the idea of tw mid 20th century jazz in New York City. Um, but there wasn't anything more than that at all. And, uh, and the other thing is, I think Barry, Barry's amazing because you know, we both acknowledge we don't know what the right sound is for the score. Um, and actually, I think the process of making the score is the discovery process of what the score will be. Like, it's very much a moment to moment following of these feelings and experimenting. So, you know, it, it'd, be, it'd be amazing if there was this intellectual idea of, oh, this is the score and we'd go execute it. It's, it couldn't be further from the way it actually works out. So then you were presumably writing music while he was actually shooting the picture and maybe sending ideas or even discussing with Barry? So while he was shooting, um, I began experimenting with a few ideas. I started uh, writing pieces for trumpets, uh, flugelhorn, French horn, cornet, and really I'd never had the chance to experiment with the, with the way that those colors match and, and mix and what does that do to the sound. And I had this idea that I wanted to, you know, from those very early conversations with Barry, what if I took uh, mid 20th century types of harmonies, but wrote them in a more, um, almost like a through composed kind of classical way. So, you know, what would it sound like if I wrote a piece for brass, um, but the, the link to jazz was the fact that there were seventh chords and ninth chords and 11th chords. And that was the way where we're sort of like, you know, atmospherically connecting it, but the music itself was whatever I was feeling at that moment. So I started to do that and um, I didn't play him anything until he had finished shooting. And then I played him some of these pieces. And when I just played the music for him, he really loved, loved it. There was this one piece in particular, he really loved it. But when we put it up against the picture, it was missing something, it wasn't quite right. Interesting. And that was something where, you know, uh, I guess, I, you know, it, it's a starting point for further discussion because, you know, the movie's telling you something. The movie's saying, it's not quite, not there, you know, what, so what do we do? And there was this idea of, well, what if I started taking the music I'd written for brass and tried writing it on strings, on cellos in particular? 
And what's fascinating is the way in which same notes, but on a different instrument, feels like completely different music. And did that know? work? That started to work. And that became this feeling of love that's in the movie. Um, as you know, Beale Street is about love and injustice, and the focus on love and the focus on all of the different kinds of love, be it romantic love, um, the love that parents feel for their children, um, there's a focus on even a sort of almost divine, unconditional love. Um, and the cellos and the way that I would evolve those pieces um, became our way through those ideas of love, and we actually named the score cues after the ancient Greek words for love. So there is a piece called agape, there's a piece called eros, storge, philia. So it was a very conscious um, you know, process that we had of thinking through what the, what the meaning of that was um, as, as, as to the love. It's kind of a downbeat story. And I wondered if you guys thought about how the music would either amplify that feeling or maybe give us a little bit of a, a sense of hope at the same time? The question of the emotional uh, landscape is, is a big one. Um, and for us, I think it's interesting because it's very mo moment to moment, we're looking at specific scenes and we're, you know, I'm, and I'm getting guidance from Barry, you know, I mean, one of the things I love most is that he knows what he wants to feel. And I'm then able to receive that and try to figure out a way to, you know, if he says to me, you know, we're at the opening of the film and he says to me, we need joy. So then I get to say to myself, okay, what is that? How, what notes, what chords, what sound colors can I bring together that to me feel like that? And so it's very moment to moment and the way in which I think we find that the mixture of emotions that I think you're, you're getting at is there are moments in the film that, that need a different sound world and you know one in particular I think is the um, that moment where you see Daniel talking to Fani about his experience in prison how he's been unjustly imprisoned and um, the horror of that and that was a whole other sound world that I actually created from literally from the stems of the cello that plays when you um, see Tish and Fani first making love taking those cellos and bending them and you know Barry would say to me how do we break that sound how do we you know we were looking how do we like harm the sound so that the music itself is being harmed in the way that the love of the characters is being harmed so it, it became in a way this kind of musical metaphor I guess of what was happening but but there are these different you know there's definitely there's this dark very dark hellish almost you know soundscape and then there is at the same time this sound of love and beauty and joy. Um, so, you know, I think that throughout there was a motif in the melody that f was always reaching upward. And to me, I think that symbolizes the, uh, you know, you mentioned hope um, and uh, a perseverance because there are a few very key moments in the film where, for example, when um, Tish and Fani realize that they're going to be able to rent that apartment and you see them yelling to the sky out of joy. And that was in the script, that moment. And I remember seeing that and thinking to myself, you know, what would, how could you make music where the music feels like it's yelling to the sky? And so there was this idea ahead of a, you know, almost like an upward trumpet motif that would, that would literally sort of shoot upwards. And from that, I think I felt this feeling of the, the melody that could itself, you know, there's this sort of melody that goes, you know, da, 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 that kind of, you know, that kind of upward reach leap. And um, I, you know, I believe that the melodies have, the shapes of melodies matter. I think they do. I think we, you know, sort of uh, neurologically almost, the way that the shape of melody implies some sort of a, almost like a physics in a way, where it's something going upward or something going downward, and then all the concomitant kind of emotions associated with that. So tell me about the ensemble. Sure. It feels, the score feels very intimate to yes. me. Yes. And I wonder if that means that you didn't have many strings or many brass players. Uh, it's a very small group of, of very close friends. In particular, uh, my wife, Caitlin, is the cellist. Really? Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I think one, one of the wonderful things is when you find um, a group of, of friends that you can collaborate with and in a lot of ways I think that's what I love most about film in general too. It's such a collaborative form where it is the, the team, it's the group that makes the film um, and I love that sense of kind of 
the community that gets to work together. I think there's something, um, you know, obviously there's many times where I'm just alone in my studio working, but I think it's the it's the opportunity to share this together, you know, in the same way that I'm writing the music, I couldn't write the music without Barry there. Um, and similarly, I, you know, it's these, it's the incredible musicians I've had the opportunity to work with, whether it's, you know, Caitlin, who's just an amazing cellist, or, you know, on Moonlight, Tim Fain, who's an amazing violin soloist, you know, this, the, the, the sounds that are possible with that um, are not only inspiring, but incredibly impactful for the eventual effect of the, of the film. Toward the end of the score, toward the end of the film, there's a piano piece. Yes. On, on, the, on the album, it's called Requiem. Yes. I thought that was kind of a different sound than most of what I'd heard, and I wondered why that choice, and if it's you on piano. So that's me on the piano. That is me on the piano. Um, interestingly, that is <clears throat> a, the, the piece I first mentioned, Harlem Aria, um, that is not in the movie. That's the brass piece that something was missing. Um, the music from that piece is throughout the movie. So that while that version wasn't there, um, there were many iterations. So the melody you hear starting from the very beginning in, in the track Eden Harlem, uh, and the chords and the melody are in Requiem. Actually, that's that you know it's a it's a very sparse texture. Um, there's actually not a lot of piano in the score for Beale Street. That's one of the few places where I think the the simplicity and the purity of what the notes sound like um, resonated there to us. One of the uh, points that you brought up earlier was the fact that there is a little Miles Davis and little John Coltrane sure. uh, in the movie. Yes. Uh, was that, did that have any impact on you, either because you needed to write something that was different or perhaps allude to it in some subtle musical way? I think those first conversations where Barry said the word jazz, um, you know, very much it was about Th you know, thinking about there are going to be a few moments in the film clearly where I think those, you know, those kind of needle drops may exist. Um, and for me and for Barry, I think it's always very important that the score is its own unique world. Um, there's something, you know, the w there's the world of the characters and then there's our world in the audience. And there are times where those worlds interact. Actually, for example, in that scene with Daniel and Fani, um, that's something that I always find fascinating is that the way in which, for, for example, there, as Daniel is speaking to Fani, you're hearing Blue and Green on the record player. And then I started running the Blue and Green through a long-tailed reverb. So it starts, ch your, your sense of time and perception starts feeling like it's changing. And we had this idea of, well, what if as that's happening, this hellish soundscape of the, the broken Eros track starts almost emerging from the floorboards, this feeling of hell and of injustice. And what I love about that, I mean, what, what was great was that it worked because that idea, you know, it sounds interesting, but there's every chance in the world that that doesn't work. You know, you try this out and you're like, you know what? Nope, that experiment did not work. But it did work for us. And um, not only did it open up a whole, uh, you know, range of potential ideas for the rest of the film and the ways that we would deal with the feeling of injustice, but also I think when score and source almost kind of like speak to each other, I think it has an opportunity for, it almost feels like the movie screen vanishes in a way. You know, the, what we have in the score in our, in the audience's world, all of a sudden we are connecting directly with what the characters are hearing in a weird way. And I think there's something sort of beautiful about that where the sort of, you know, like the, the diegetic and non-diegetic worlds kind of collide. Sure, sure. If Beale Street could talk, and, and also Moonlight have contributed, I think, to the national conversation about race and justice. What does it feel like to be a part of that? It's very humbling. Um, you know, I think it, it's a very, you know, I feel very blessed, honestly, to be able to work with someone like Barry Jenkins, who is able to, through his work, um, to say something, and also, I think, to bring the emotion to these stories, you know? Um, I think one of the most beautiful things about film in general, and I think one of the things I love about film is that there's something that happens when you see a work of art, and for me, you know, films are these works of art where you understand things differently when they're connected to an emotion. I think, you know, the conversations and the ideas that are inherent in, let's say, Moonlight, or if Beale Street could talk, are incredibly important. 
But on top of that, it's not just the ideas that are important, it's the feeling of those ideas and the understanding, I think, that comes from what Barry creates. Um, so, so, you know, I, I, yeah, I guess I just, I feel so humbled to get that opportunity to work with him on these projects. Um, it's interesting that you also did another major film this year that is actually up for some other awards, which is Vice. Yes. Um, and it's actually quite a different score. Very different score. <laughs> um, what else have you got going on? Can we expect anything uh, from you in the coming months that you uh, can talk about? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm starting to uh, explore the, the sound of season two for HBO's Succession show that I, that I worked on last year. Um, and Barry and I have started some very early conversations about his Underground Railroad project that he's beginning to work on as well. Oh, so that's another, very early stage, very early stage. But that's yeah. another exciting project. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. yeah. Nick, thank you for being with us today. Thank you, John, thank you so much. Okay.